Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live event, Winning AI Adoption, a chat with investment innovators. I am Andrea Sala, and today I'll be your moderator. Firstly, I want to emphasize that this is a live session, and we encourage active participation from all of you. If you're joining us on LinkedIn, please feel free to comment below your questions and thoughts. And for those attending via Zoom, you can leave a message in the chat. Today, our focus is on the crucial topic of AI adoption. As you may have noticed, AI adoption has become a hot topic across a wide array of industries, and investments are no exception. The transition towards embracing, embracing AI is not only happening now, but is also showing no signs of stopping anytime soon. During this live event, we will explore the current state of AI adoption and its impact in the investment process. Our aim is to share success stories that illustrate how organizations have effectively integrated AI into their processes. At M.M, we have been developing AI for investments throughout the past seven years. And through our experience, we have witnessed and uncovered a clear path emerging for the successful implementation of AI in the investment process. And, you know, as part of our constant effort of leading this transition, we take part in many peer to peer discussions to explain how this transition can be done. What are the best practices, opportunities, and pitfalls in AI adoption? And you know, today is no exception. This is why we have numerous leading investment innovators to share with you the clear path of AI adoption with you today. Now, as previously mentioned, we've been doing this for the past seven years. We've spent already developing AI for investment decision making. And today we are almost 110 investment professionals and 60 of those are including the M.M Lab, which is our international network of academic thought leaders and universities. Today, our offices are spread out across London, Milan, and New York, and our solutions include portfolio advisory, which are bespoke AI-driven portfolios at security level for $1 billion in assets under advisory, as well as our platform, Sphere, which supports the investment process through the power of AI for a total of $120 billion in assets under technology. Today, we support institutional clients across the EU, the US, and the UK, all being institutional investors, such as banks, insurance companies, family offices, asset and wealth managers. Now, before I kickstart today's conversation, I would like to touch upon the topics that we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be touching the topics that are mainly about winning AI adoption, this including the role of AI in investments, leveraging AI to unlock hidden opportunities, the nexus between human intelligence and AI, and finally wrapping up the conversation with the key steps to begin the AI adoption journey. Now, remember, since this is a live session, we are going to have a live Q&A, so stick to the end. And if you have any questions throughout the conversation, you can leave them below and we will address them at the end. Now, today joining us, we have a great lineup of industry leaders who will share with us their knowledge, experience uh, in regarding to winning AI adoption and investments. Firstly, we have Giuseppe Tedone, who is the head of Bearings Portfolio Analytics team. With over 20 years of experience in the investment field, he's responsible for leading the quantitative research. Then we have Maria Primorak, and working at Casey Quirk as a manager. Uh, she's an experienced professional dedicated to asset management strategy consulting. Then we have Daniel Grabowski. He is an investment strategist at Apple Bank and conducts the tactical as well as the strategic asset allocation. And finally, but certainly not least, we have Axel Mayo, who's a partner at M.M and has over 20 years of experience in the asset management industry and today will be providing the perspective on AI regarding this topic. Now, thank you all for being here today. Happy to be here. <laughs> now, <Thanks> as, <laughs> great. Now, as previously mentioned, you know, AI adoption is a topic that is everywhere right now. At an industry level, it is truly being constantly addressed. So to kickstart today's conversation, I would like to first have an industry perspective on this topic. So none other than Maria, you that you work with numerous clients um, and throughout your experience, I would like to ask you, in which ways do you see asset and wealth managers integrating AI nowadays? And how can AI integration help financial institutions unlock new organic opportunities? Great question, Andrea, and thank you for inviting me to participate here. We work a lot with our clients and discuss topics around investments, around distribution, finding new growth opportunities, where they are hidden. 
But we also spend lately a lot of time talking about AI because it's such a big topic. Now, the technology itself is not new. It's been used in the investment process by many firms for quite a number of years. Just think about quant shops and how they've used it in the past. But what we've actually seen proliferate is application of the technology within different parts of the organization. So there are two values that many managers are looking to explore. One is driving the operational efficiency, whether within the operations themselves or actually within different parts of organizations, such as distribution, having more effective sales force or actually looking to unlock new growth opportunities. It can be within distribution. So as you think about using some of the more targeted sales, client segmentation, sales targeting, retention targeting, in order to identify opportunities to develop new products and to sell them. But a lot more we are seeing managers explore AI in their investment process. So looking to use it for better, more assisted decision making. And we see it in two ways. One, with the very start, the research process, and that's the most prevalent area where we see our clients use AI or explore use of AI. One example is just ESG data, exploring alternative data sets that can actually bring more value around ESG, which is such a critical topic, especially if you're a European asset manager where it's a requirement now to deliver more sustainable investments. But more and more asset managers are exploring also using AI further down the investment process. So more assisted decision making. So having more predictive analytics. What if analysis, scenario modeling, looking at the sentiment. So anything that can provide them with the insights to make better informed investment decisions. Thank you, Maria. And yeah, definitely. I think we've seen the benefit of AI increasing asset and wealth management, you know, operational deficiency, and therefore, well, in such a way they can gain a competitive edge, uh, definitely. So thank you for that industry perspective. Um, and I think now the conversation, now that we've gathered, you know, that industry perspective, we should shift more towards an investment perspective. And I'd say the perfect person uh, to gather that perspective is Axel Meyer, who, well, he works in this specific area of AI and investments. So Axel, what would you say is the role of AI investments and what does it mean to have an investment process enhanced by AI? Mm -hmm. I think Maria gave a wonderful framework to, to work from. Um, you know, as, as she pointed out very well that, you know, Asset managers, wealth managers, asset owners are using AI. But the question is, you know, what, as you say, what role does it actually play? Um, and th let me start with something very blunt and saying you know, AI, it's just a tool. It's a very powerful tool. Think about it if you, if you have to you have to cut down a tree and the only tool you have available is a nail file. It's possible to do that. It will take you a very long time to cut down the tree. If you have a chainsaw, then it's going very quickly. Um, the chainsaw by itself wouldn't be able to cut the tree. It needs a human who can use it properly. Uh, and so this is what we see with AI. It, it's a, an extremely powerful tool that can assist and support uh, decision-making um, within an investment pro um, process. And some of the attributes that it has ma makes it so powerful. One, of course, you know, if it's done properly, it's unbiased, it's unemotional, it's independent, and it uses undisputable data. And it can do that, it can analyze that in a fraction of time. So one of the reasons we actually talk about AI within that context right now, why it can be such an important tool, is that you know, over the last few years, it became economically viable to use it. You know, computing costs went down, computing power went up. Um, the number, the amount of data out there is growing and growing. Just to give you an idea, about 90% of the data that exists today has been generated in the last two years. And so, you know, here you have a tool that allows you to go through this data, tries out all possible combinations of this data that will lead to better, more robust results. It is something that can do that extremely fast with a lot of data. Um, it never loses concentration. It never loses speed. It never loses focus. You have something like this available, so why wouldn't you use it? So I think this is this is uh, an understanding. I think that's, that's slowly developing. That you know, investors, people who make investment decisions, see it's it's a fantastic tool where this combination of the, the human mindset, the mo human creativity, 
takes advantage of the, the heavy lifting that the AI is doing. So think about the nail file and the chainsaw, then I think it gets the big job. I think that was a, actually a great analogy of using the tool like uh, a chainsaw, you know, because it can't work on its own. It needs a human to control it and guide it, you know, like it's just a tool that supports investment professionals mm -hmm. with forward looking, unbiased inputs. Um, so I would like um, to know maybe how this works more on a day to day basis. So I think I would have Daniel Grabowski. Um, I'd like to ask you and in, in your role, maybe, uh, how are these new AI platforms enhancing investor managers, talents and skills? So in which specific areas do these new tools assist professionals like yourself in navigating volatile market conditions with increased confidence? Yeah, first of all, let me just say um, hi to everybody. And um, so maybe to answer your question, I would like to start a bit in a general way. I think there are four important properties of a decision-making process which can all be significantly, significantly enhanced by AI. And these are timeliness, objectivity, independence, and reliability. And Axel already mentioned two of these, so let me maybe explain what I mean by these. When I say timeliness, what I mean is AI can evaluate all the data every day and put it into some historical context. And I don't think humans can do this. It's First of all, too much data, it's getting more by the day. And also it takes time actually to come up with historical context to uh, what time I best compare, for example, something to. That's actually quite a difficult task that economists and um, strategists oftentimes engage in every day and also debate about a lot. What is the appropriate um, comparison here or, or analogy here? Um, the second point I mentioned is objectivity. What I mean here is to not be influenced by current news flow because I think um, the news flow is oftentimes designed to be just emotionally um, appealing. And sometimes it, I think, has little bearing on the currently most important financial market variables. And well, third, um, related maybe is, um, uh, well, related to objectivity, but I think it's different that is independence, because I think the opinion of the AI is generated in a different way from the human opinion. And so basically, basically you could call it orthogonal or not correlated to your human opinion. But either way, what we have basically is a kind of forecast combination. So different sources of errors that are uncorrelated and so that just enhance the decision making process. If you have the human and the AI, you have different sources of er um, errors and um, combining both will be better, will have less error than just having one or the other. And maybe finally, reliability, what I mean here is actually reliability in a scientific or statistical sense. So the performance of the AI is independent of the person running it, and it will generate the same response or the same prediction every time it is run. And so therefore, I think the algorithm can, for example, be backtested to get an idea of the quality of the strengths of the weaknesses. And this also cannot do cannot be done um, with human decision making processes. And this has a couple of advantages. So keep in mind that um, the main, the three main criteria that are actually oftentimes considered in science or in statistical testing are reliability, objectivity, and validity. And so if AI can help at least in two of these three domains and also improve in some other domains too, I think this is really a big deal. And so I think this overall was a bit theoretical. So let me just give a short context, maybe from personal experience also what this could mean. Um, first of all, I think, Asset allocation nowadays are a lot based on whether this is um, risk on or risk off decisions. And because assets are, well, and asset classes are highly correlated, so it's crucial to get this right, so market direction to get it right. But as humans, we are highly influenced also by the news flow. And I find it personally very difficult to not be swayed actually by the latest news story or the, just the market performance of the last few days. So just having this AI that looks at returns, looks at correlation patterns, and objectively compare them to past patterns. I think that's really helpful. Yeah, thank you, Daniel. Um, uh, I I really see uh, how you bring out the value of combining, you know, that human perspective, that human touch with the AI's perspective, as you say about the on, like reliability, that objectivity. Um, I think it really, you know, brings shines that value that AI can bring to one's 
general workflow, especially as an investment professional. Um, however, uh, I do think that we have to take into account how these financial institutions might approach that integration of such new tools. Um, so I would like to have uh, Giuseppe answer uh, another question that I have, which is uh, what would you say is the right mentality to approach AI adoption as an asset management company or a financial institution? How can these asset managers benefit from this technology in order to improve investment strategies and solutions? Thank you, Andrea. I'll start by saying something that might sound obvious, and that is asset managers surely have the financial resources to explore and develop tools that make use of artificial intelligence. But yet, a number of asset managers find it challenging to adopt AI because they do not have the right mentality and approach. Now, I appreciate that is a fairly general statement, and of course, there are exceptions. There is a number of asset managers of various sizes that have successfully started their AI journey and successfully integrated elements of AI into their investment processes. I would say that there are multiple approaches that have proven to be effective, successful, but they all have similar aspects, which I would describe as the, the right mentality. Be open-minded, start with the testing of small ideas, but then move fast once the idea has been validated be patient with the analyses, but always seek to challenge the status quo and announce it, right? So finally, I believe that finding the right partners on that AI journey is critical. While asset managers have the, the resources and the competence to develop AI processes in ours, there is always AI-based innovation that fintech companies can generate. And so that should not be underestimated. I, I would say a couple of... Uh, of, of other things um, in relation to the the fact that AI really has the characteristics of being applicable across a number of disciplines and departments. And the companies that are able to do that will no doubt have a sustained and strategic competitive advantage in the long term, no doubt. But when it comes to applications of AI to the investment process, in addition to the significant benefits of the increased operational efficiency, there are benefits in the form of classical risk adjusted returns and based on our experience ai has the potential to enhance returns but more importantly in relation to what daniel said as it provides a new perspective compared to human to the human one that translates into lower correlations between ai and other sources of alphas for example which is an incredible you know, incredibly beneficial aspect in a world where even government bonds and risky assets have become uh, correlated. So I'll stop there. Thank you for that answer. I think uh, it's, it's it was a great answer, especially how asset managers can approach AI adoption by embracing, you know, that innovative and open-minded uh, mentality as a whole company. Uh, and talking about mentality and also what you referred to Daniel previously, uh, he said about the human plus AI perspective, combining it. I would like to go back to that because really it's sort of like we are going towards a new quantum mental approach. So Daniel, what does this new quantum mental approach look like in practice based on your experience and how are AI's inputs helping portfolio managers and investment committees achieve more informed asset allocation decisions? Yeah, I think it's really um, important what Giuseppe said. Also, there are these different um, areas maybe where you can apply AI in general. And so, for example, where I have most contact with is decisions about asset allocation. They are oftentimes made in investment committees. And uh, I think, for example, there's always a risk of a group think that the most emotionally appealing argument or easy arguments will be settled on. And I think that's a big risk. And so from my experience, just having an AI recommendation out there, for example, already provides a neutral counterpoint to the human suggestions that will be made here. And so basically from the get-go, this creates a, an open environment and a very healthy debate. And so people will dare to speak up, find the courage to speak up against um, some views that some uh, maybe otherwise influential people in this committee will have, because there's already another recognized um, opinion as a counterbalance point here um, existing already. 
And um, I think also that this is in particular helpful that humans tend maybe to have certain views and tend not to have other views. And if the AI challenges something that appears to a human, maybe clear cut and obvious, but all of a sudden the AI says, no, 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 I disagree, then we have to maybe rethink and think a bit harder about um, this aspect, what's really um, going on here. And a, a relate, related point to this is basically more about the human biases because we've all been educated on human biases, I think, as investors. But unfortunately, also psychological studies just show that the more intelligent you are, the better you are at fooling yourself. So that's the unfortunate truth. And so basically, um, the more educated you are, the easier it is for you to construct arguments to justify whatever position you like and an opinion that you might already have. You can massage the data, you can construct elaborate arguments and so on. And so this is not just a risk of group things. There are other very important and potentially detrimental biases here, I think. And these are, for example, overconfidence and confirmation bias. And there are studies right, on successful forecasting that just show that overconfidence and confirmation bias are the main obstacles actually to successful um, predictions. And it's not intelligence, it's actually these biases. And so having an artificial intelligence that doesn't just add intelligence, but also reduces these biases, um, helps investment committee decision-making, for example, is like really um, important. Yeah, uh, it's great. It's very valuable how AI can provide investment committees with direct and unbiased inputs, as you said. You know, it's uh, thank you for that. You know, practical example of how an investment committee can benefit directly from AI. You know, this innovative tools. Now, it leads me to believe. But how can these innovative tools can be effectively integrated into processes? How can a financial institution adopt these effective tools? So I would like to ask Giuseppe, from your perspective as a seasoned investment professional, what do you believe are the factors to be considered when starting that AI adoption process? Well, I guess everyone has got its, uh, its own secret sauce and, uh, and beliefs, but I would say there are three key aspects that I would, uh, that would, I would allow, highlight to answer that question, uh, Andrea. The, the first one is theory and practice have to align. It is not sufficient to prove that an AI-based strategy works on paper. It needs to be tested with real money in the real world, in a real investment process. The second one uh, to me is transparency and explainability, if you prefer which I know is a key pillar of M.M's uh, philosophy. Develop a process that is as much as possible transparent and explainable, no matter how different is the AI perspective compared to the human perspective, at least intuitively in terms of input and output, uh, we have to understand what happens and what to expect. And I, I, I believe that is a critical, critical aspect. Third and final, scalability which to me has a dual connotation. The first one relates to operational efficiency, and we have touched upon operational efficiency a few times um, uh, today, and, and I'm sure everyone understands that aspect. But the second one, which is a bit more subtle, uh, relates to the capacity of the investment strategy. And what I mean by that is the level of assets under management that can be managed following that AI strategy. Uh, we have seen promising AI strategies that don't scale, don't, don't have much capacity. And so that, that is sometimes an issue. Um, so these are all the key aspects that we consider when de developing AI-based offer strategies at Barings. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the importance of transparency, it's so important to talk about it when we're talking about AI and as well as ensuring the scalability of the technology, especially for a large financial institution. We have to take that into consideration. Um, however, uh, those being the factors, I believe our audience would also like to learn those key steps, the concrete ground principles in order to integrate AI into the investment process. So I would like to have Axel, you that you work in a specific field and you have helped well, numerous financial institutions uh, integrate AI already in their investment process. Um, could you share maybe some ground principles and best practices learned throughout your experience in helping these institutional investors successfully integrate AI? Sure. So it's, you know, it's, we all have to be aware that this, we're talking about a technology that is on the one hand, not that new, but within the investment world, it's, it's new, right? So there, there's interesting statistics from the CFA Institute about the difference of how many companies 
you know, would like to use AI and how many are actually doing it. It's a big gap in between. And part of that is, I think, a, 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 a conscious or unconscious res, res, you know, reservedness against this new topic about you know, maybe not understanding it. And so, you know, we have been working with, you know, different kinds of institutional investors across the board, and they have um, they implemented and used AI um, on various levels and in various areas and to different extents. But what's clear across all of them is we found there, there are three pillars of success that need to be given to make sure it works. And, you know, Giuseppe, you pointed out um, one uh, in, in your first comment about the, the mentality. And I think this is one of the key things yeah, within a firm, you know, there, there should be a mentality. And then, you know, Daniel, you're, you're alluding to that as well. Um, there should be a mentality about, yes, we want to see how it can do, like an openness and willingness. And it needs almost like a, a sponsor, a champion within that company to drive it forward, to say that, you know, we have to deal with what we, we would like to, uh, to deal with this topic. We want to get insights. We are open-minded about it. The result might be that the answer is no but it has been dealt with. And I think this is very critical. So that this open-mindedness, the mentality about, yes, this could work, um, we need to look into that. Um, then there's also the, um, this understanding about you know, the, the internal versus the, the external leverage. I mean, it has become, uh, hopefully, also through the discussions, a comment we heard also from what, what Maria said um, at the beginning, you know, it's a very complex thing, AI. You cannot do it with two people that share a laptop. And so it's that understanding about that part of it, the outsourcing makes sense, which what we have seen has a very, very beneficial impact on the team within the client who actually deals with the, the connection there. So there was a big learning curve for when, when we started implementing solutions for clients, a big learning curve on the client side about an understanding capabilities and limitations of that. So I think that's the one. And then the, 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 the last one, and these three pillars, I don't know particularly all, but the last one is really like this customized and integrated. So anytime basically talking about AI and if it's suitable for you, and if, again, Giuseppe, your comment about scalability of investment process comes in there. Um, you know, it, the, the AI has adopted to you, not the other way around. Yeah, that, you know, one of the key features of AI is it adapts, it learns to market changes. So. You know, why should you as the user, you as the human who uses adopt to the eye? It has to be the other way around. So I think this is almost, you know, when, when trying to find a partner to work with us, the, the litmus test is really, you know, is the AI adapting to what I need? Um, and so if these three things are given, then it is going uh, to be a success. And the, uh, the, the other part that I would mention that within that context is usually... You know, it's good. So if you have, if the number one is given about the mentality, the openness, then to, to sit down, you know, with the client and say, okay, what's the area of least resistance? You know, where can we use AI where we don't need to have systems involved? We don't need to have IT involved, where we don't have to make a change, where we just add information. So as, as Daniel pointed out, you have, you have a, a sounding board for that. And then, you know, trust is built. So I think that's, I think the, the three pillars plus finding the air of least resistance, if that's given, it's going to be successful, I guarantee it. Thank you, Axel. I think those are great pillars, and especially since we've touched upon so many times on the right mentality that these institutions have to have, um, but also, you know, leveraging those internal and external capabilities. Um, even Giuseppe touched upon, you know, finding that right AI partner. Um, they they all sound with previous points that we've touched upon throughout the conversation. So I guess they, these are the the key right ground principles in order for financial institutions to succeed successfully integrate AI in their investment process. And now as we've covered, you know, these, these ground principles, I guess what we have only left today is sort of this industry outlook and none other than Maria um, can provide us with such an insight um, for that asset management, AI adoption, industry outlook. So Maria, as AI integration becomes more prevalent in asset management, how would you think the use of this technology will look like in the future? Yeah, that's actually a great question. And even internally, we had a lot of debates. So you have different camps, right? You 
there's a camp of us that thinks about AI in a form of, as Axel mentioned it at the very start, it's a chainsaw, it's a tool that you're using. But there's also a camp where you think outside of the industry, will it become similar to self-driving cars? Will there be a way in which we see the industry using fully AI-driven investment processes and decision-making across majority of asset managers? And as you think about the operating environment right now, and if you think about the, if you think about the actual regulatory pressure and how highly regulated this industry is, I believe what we will end up seeing is more of that AI being a tool type of approach, and that it will many, many more asset managers as they start responding to some of the complexities of the operating environment going forward will start seeing the value. Of using, alter, of using AI in their investment process, but even broadly across the firm. And we'll put a lot of effort and financial means into investing, into building those types of technologies so that they can drive the efficiency, they can have the better decision-making when it comes to whether even operationally financial results, driving better results, or even on the investment side, um, it will become a lot more difficult to drive growth because if you look at some of the outlook, it's becoming, it's slowing down. Alternatives are slowing down in terms of organic growth, China, some of the different markets. So you'll really have to explore different ways of finding those new opportunities going forward. And AI will enable asset managers, especially investment professionals, as everyone mentioned, to have ability to find those alternative sources using whether alternative data or using better assisted decision making. So what we will end up seeing is AI being real, very much an enabler, or as um, I like to use one of my partner's analogies, it will become a bionic arm for humans. So a natural extension that is more powerful and tech driven. That's that's another great analogy, a second another great analogy as a, a bionic arm that, yeah, it definitely supports us. Like it doesn't replace, but rather assist humans uh, in their decisions. As as you said, there is a new need, a new way to uncover those hidden opportunities uh, nowadays. Thank you. Thank you, Maria, uh, for that industry perspective on the future outlook of um, AI adoption and asset management. Now, I think that here uh, is a great place to begin in our Q&A session. Um, so we are open to questions right now. So if our viewers from LinkedIn are, want to leave a comment or Zoom want to leave a question in the chat, you're more than welcome to right now. We are, you can direct your question to any of the speakers or make it in general. We've actually already begun to receive some of the questions. Um, so the first one, actually, uh, I think I'm going to give it to Giuseppe. Um, how would you say, how does AI explainability impact trust and adoption in portfolio analytics at your organization? Yeah, good, good question, uh, Andrea. I, I would say definitely transparency and explainability helps adoption and percent, especially when those AI tools and models are there to support the investment teams that are uh, following an investment approach that is more fundamental. So definitely a uh, massive, massive help if uh, if they can be explained, uh, at least intuitively. Uh, the risk is if they cannot, the risk is that you have to really have faith into them, almost like uh, we used to, to call the traditional quant a black box. This is like, uh, has the potential to be a black hole. And so you, you have to really be faithful that that black hole is giving you what you need. But I, I, I do believe it's an important aspect to at least intuitively be able to explain what is going on. Otherwise, the risk is that adoption is affected quite quite significantly. Okay. Thank you. I think that's a great question. You always want to know what is going on behind that technology and ensure that uh, transparency when you're trying to adopt it. Um, then uh, um, I'm going to say I'm going to address this question to Maria. So uh, what would be your advice for asset and wealth management companies starting their AI journey? A great question. Um, and I think I'll probably reuse some of the things that Axel mentioned around best practices. What we've seen with a lot of asset managers and wealth managers, even as they think broadly about technology and implementing it within their organization, there's a lot of resistance. 
But what, where it first starts is you have to be clear around what is the use case for any types of technology. And that includes also AI being specific. And the best way to start with building that use case and understanding what the value of it is, is by understanding also what you currently have in-house. So for AI, you actually need a lot of data. Um, the best way to use AI is by having relevant data. So from that perspective, you need to understand where all the data parts sit within your organization. What is the amount of data, what kind of data, and the quality of that data to be able to really have those powerful analytics that will not only provide a hindsight view, but also the foresight that we mentioned earlier. And then probably the second element that is pro very critical in driving the adoption is and starting the journey is having the right leader to drive that. Um, and not only from a perspective of having the right technical skill set, but also someone that is able to drive from a top level adoption that is able to also bring the business leaders from different parts of the organization along the journey and actually hold them um, accountable for results and implementing AI across the different parts of the organization. The rest really is more around how you execute, how you develop the strategy around AI. But in order to start, you first have to do, have those two critical elements in mind. Thank you, Maria. I think it's great advice, especially since uh, you usually collaborate with numerous clients. I'm sure, um, uh, well, you've had your experience in advising these types of companies for this. So, uh, well, thank you. Um, the next question I would like to address it to Daniel. So which factors make... AI adoption allows small to medium asset managers to stay competitive in an increasingly complex landscape. Mm. Yeah, that's actually a question we are also oftentimes thinking about. And of course, one issue is just the quantity of data that you can analyze. The other aspects I already touched upon um, would be the um, speed with which you can actually analyze um, the data. So there are, of course, different ways. We've also touched on these points, how you could maybe use AI to um, keep up. You could, of course, have, um, as Maria also um, yeah, alluded to, could have a, a strategy just run or a portfolio just run by AI. That is currently, however, an approach we are not so much looking at, but rather it's this, um, also what Axel talked about, just enhancing our processes. So. It could be just being more efficient, outsourcing some task, or just getting more information from different sources in a very timely manner into the process. That otherwise we cannot all look at the um, we, can, we couldn't all look at all of this data. And so I think this is really um, some of the most important aspects. But of course, there are very different, many different ways in which you can use it. There are um, risk management applications, there are return prediction applications, and um, if you maybe then also can specialize on some areas where you are really good at as a smaller company and have other things um, given more responsibility to an AI that is perhaps one of the best ways that mm -hmm. this can be done. Okay, thank you, Daniel. Now, I was just looking at some other questions that we received from the Zoom uh, and LinkedIn attendees. This one is for Axel. Um, you have all talked a lot about using AI to enhance existing human-based investment strategies. Do you know any managers where the AI is in their investment process? Where the AI is in their investment process? Yes. Oh, that, that's, a, uh, that's a very interesting question. So I can say, you know, without tooting our horn to so us, the only thing we do is AI, so it's in our investment process. Um, but, it, it, you know, this is, if, if you think about, um, if you think about using an asset manager that, uses AI or you want to employ an asset manager that uses AI to enhance the process, I think it makes a lot of sense really to drill very deep and see, you know, what the level of AI is. Um, I think it's, you know, AI right now is very much on book, so everybody likes to say they use AI. So I would just recommend, um, you know, drilling very deep and find out, you know, what is the level of AI? Is it how fundamentally sound is it? Is there enough uh, research behind it has it been proved what what Giuseppe was saying um you know uh, has it proved its its value with real money so I, I would go into this direction um it's unfortunately using AI is not a a, a recognized label yet you you cannot patent it so uh you really have to do your own homework and find out uh, if there's good uh, sustainable and independent AI behind it 
Great, thank you. Um, we are receiving even more questions. Um, actually, the next one um, is for Maria from Paul. Paul is asking, Maria, given your experience in helping clients and different organizations adopt AI, how many institutions integrate AI in their investment decisions after ensuring the AI models and the data fed into the models are cleansed appropriately, where noise has been filtered to only retain valuable relevant data? And then it says, how, so how important is explainability? Okay, um, Paul, thank you for the question. A great one. Um, look, there are already asset managers that are really basing their investment process on AI. So they are very quant-driven, model-driven, and they it's a continuous and iterative process where you continue to have these feedback loops and also improve and enhance. Um, as I believe Giuseppe or Daniel mentioned, it's just looking at a theory without putting it into real life example doesn't work. You always miss something. So it's really important to let it run and then continue to iterate. And with a lot of asset managers that are more traditional in that sense and are looking into using um, AI in their process, they usually start with research piece, right? It doesn't go into the to the extent where it actually provides assisted decision making. It's more so making sure that you go through that data process and that you get the right set of data initially, um, or specifically filling some of the data gaps or drawing more insights from the existing data sources. And one of the examples with asset managers that we work with at Casey Quirk is, especially on the ESG side, uh, more and more asset managers are using either ESG data providers that base their process on a using AI, machine learning, NLP as well, or they're doing it themselves to identify the different sentiments that goes beyond just what you might receive in terms of ratings and scorings for different companies and holdings. Uh, in terms of explainability, I think Daniel already explained that point. So um, maybe we allow for other questions. Okay, sure. No, no problem. I think we've also touched upon uh, the topic of explainability and transparency quite a couple of times today. So no problem. Now, the next question is for Daniel. Um, we are talking about AI for professional investors. Are these tools adapted in a simple manner to the market of private investors? Um, so if the question is regarding to um, to what extent can private investors use this tool, well, um, there's first of all one Are issue. Are these tools adapted in a simpler manner, basically? Mm -hmm. um, so we would, for example, use them in wealth management for clients, of course, to um, use them for them. But um, first of all, like maybe I think there's a certain gap in the sense that it's a bit easier to communicate to institutional investors because we can just spend more time with one specific client to explain them the process and to take away any potential maybe fear or hesitation. So, of course, um, it's more difficult to communicate this to a broader group of smaller investors. And, of course, for them personally, um, accessing these might for different reasons there might be some issues with this but generally speaking this is of course possible so we can either use the input from ai in our decision making process we could have portfolios and we also have thought about this having a portfolio or some wealth management strategy run by ai um, exclusively and then basically market this to um, our clients so that actually individual investors could invest in these um, AI-driven strategies. And I think not all investors would choose to do this, but some certainly um, would do this. So um, in that sense, um, this is something where I'm sure in the future, the industry will move into this direction and to some extent. Thank you, Daniel. The upcoming question uh, is for Axel. Uh, Axel, can we have some examples of actual value added quantified if possible, by AI within the investment process? What are typical AI project implementation timelines and dependencies? Okay, so I start with the last part of that question. So if we, we, we usually, if you look at a, a process of implementing AI, it has five steps. So the first two steps would be, you know, a client uh, thinks about a framework where, to, where they want to use AI. In the second step, they would uh, select a partner and so of course that's really that time frame is up to the client but from the time we would get in to um, the realization the full implementation of it 
it's it's somewhere between six to six weeks to three months. Yeah, depending on the complexity who needs to be involved. Um, so it can be done, you know, uh, reasonably quickly. Um, Quantify, yes, it can be quantified. So, you know, the, the, the proof is in the pudding uh, in various ways. I um, Basically, when we look at areas of value added, there are, um, I would say, th three key areas. Um, one is the quality of the forecast. Are they right or are they wrong? Uh, we look a lot at regime changes. So how does risk change over time? Um, here the question is, is, uh, is the detection and the timing of these regime changes correct? Yes or no? Um, the third, so this, this is the forecast, and these forecasts basically are the, the basic element to build a portfolio, right? Out of that, we can, sorry if I get too technical now, but we can build a variance covariance matrix, we can build the weights of the portfolio within the guidelines given. So, and then the third element where value can be added is in the, the portfolio construction slash portfolio optimization process. And we can basically, in all of these areas, we can point out how much value has been added. Um, I just give you a couple of examples. Um, forecasting, um, let's say just the, the, the forecast about regional allocation of the fixed income or on the equity side, um, you can add um, between 50 and 80 basis points a year. Um, Sector forecasting, again, you're picking the right sectors, um, can add up to 160 basis points a year. Um, opti the, the portfolio optimization process, if you compare, you know, the way it's done through AI, through a traditional um, black litterman mean variance optimization, it um, on average would increase performance by 2.5%. It would increase the sharp ratio by about 35 percent and takes turnover down 20 percent so and as an all of that is based on real data on as, as Giuseppe said on, on data that has been invested in real money for clients so i hope it wasn't too many figures short answers yes it, it can be uh proven it's it's very critical um to you know to ask that since you know all the the, the hype around air and then how fantastic it is it's pointless if it doesn't add value Thank you, Axel. Well, I think those are really remarkable results after all. Um, uh, then the next question is from Aisha to Giuseppe. She, this person is asking, how do you see investment research evolve? Is it being augmented with AI? Great question. Well, I would say this, uh, investment research has evolved, is evolving, and will continue to evolve with the help of AI. What I see is the speed at which is evolving has increased or is increasing dramatically uh, over time. And uh, if it is, you know, ability to run cognitive search or um, look for anomalies in the data, or if it is about writing reports automatically with the help of, uh, of, of new tools, there is massive, massive uh, uh, scope for evolving investment research. Um, so yeah, um, I, I have no, I guess there is no limit to the imagination. There will be a lot that we can see coming, but there, we, there will be also a lot that we cannot see yet. So it's a fascinating journey. And even today, a number of questions and what we've been discussed, you can see the many different applications that AI offers to, uh, to the investment process. Thank you, Giuseppe. I think it's a great answer. Definitely it has numerous applications. You can see by today's discussion um, all the benefits that it can provide. Um, there's another question for Maria. This one is from Glenn. Are there any regional differences in the AI adoption or approaches to consider in a project? For example, Switzerland versus Europe versus USA, et cetera. Um, that that's a good question. Um, I don't think it's very regionally driven. Um, what I do notice in terms of regional nuances is that when it comes to any type of technology adoption or advancement, that U.S. firms are a lot further ahead than the European firms. Um, sorry to my clients, but I, I was the last couple of days at a conference that focused more also on data piece. And it's really clear when you talk to some of the continental European clients that in terms of using data and how they think about it, it's a bit behind what uh, some of the US peers are doing. 
And some of it is also because of the more traditional way of thinking, the advancement and the maturity of the asset management industry in U.S. versus Europe, how quickly firms make decisions around investments. And the second part is also around um, just broadly regulation. Um, I think a lot of the firms in Europe are facing much stricter regulation and a lot more regulation that really tends to put some of the AI use adoption or investments into more of a second priority, right? You the speed of regulation is moving on so fast in Europe that you have to prioritize how you address that to stay compliant. And then some of the other aspects and investments that you're willing to make tend to take the second priority. So I think those are most of the regional nuances in terms of any type of tech investment adoption, including AI. But it might be interesting to also hear um, the perspective from Giuseppe or Daniel, because one of them is US-based asset manager. The other one is a German based um, financial institution, so they might have a different perspective. True. Uh, let's start off with Giuseppe. What would be your perspective? Um, is it actually like very regionally driven? Like are these factors that Maria said, like do they check like you know, your organization's boxes when it comes to this? Sorry, Andrea, could you repeat that? I didn't quite get it. Um, yes, uh, we were uh, tackling the issue of if there are any regional differences in the AI adoption process or approaches to, to consider. So, for example, um, Switzerland versus Europe or versus U.S. And since you and Daniel, as Maria indicated, do have organizations in completely different geographies, um, maybe you could shed some light on this topic. Is it actually like the AI adoption difference uh, regionally driven? Yeah, it's it's an interesting one. I, I I I cannot see a reason why um, you know there would be a different predisposition. I would say probably there is a more positive bias in the U.S. given that there is such and, and Europe. Um, but I don't want to be unfair to Asia. <laughs> there is a lot going on in Asia as well. Uh, but, but maybe in the U.S. there is a bit more of an advantage because. Mm -hmm. um, Technology innovation in general has really become part of the culture, and so it's probably easier to open the door to that kind of uh, AI-based innovation. But uh, I, um, I, I think if there is a difference, um, is probably subtle. Uh, I, I believe there is a lot going on of good, good research, good work in Europe, good startups, lots of really interesting um, developments across the across the globe. I would say. Oh, thank you. Um, now, uh, since we are running a bit short on time, I think we should cover the final questions that we have from uh, our viewers. Um, Ayesha asked another question, this time for Axel, uh, which says, what is our company's perspective on AI and will it disrupt our industry? Uh, will AI ultimately replace humans? <laughs> uh, I don't think so. Um... I mean, we could say, you know, AI will not replace humans, um, I think, but, you know, a human that you, who uses AI will replace a human who doesn't. Um, it's kind of, I I'm, I'm really believe in the, the, the philosophy of AI being the tool that can be uh, applied properly. Um, and it's about making these tools as accessible, as easy to handle, um, as possible. Think about an iPhone, right? If you buy an iPhone, there's no manual in it. It's just intuitive. And so this is also, you know, what we try to do with our applications to make it as intuitive as possible. So I think, you know, you know, a few years down the road, um, this discussion wouldn't happen again since everybody's using it very naturally. And the acceptance of that has increased. The quality of it has increased. Um, you know, you have kind of separated the good ones from the bad ones um, and some kind of, of, of status will have developed um, for that. So I'm, I'm very, po very positive and I do think that the, the uh, is it disruptive? I think yes, it is since it's that, you know, people, you know, work towards this idea that here's another tool, a new tool I haven't had before um, that can help me a lot. Um, and so it is something with a capacity that hasn't existed before. So it is very disruptive. The interesting thing is going to be see where does the disruption really, really come from. 
you know, there are a lot of interesting books written about, you know, what can be disruptive and not big companies, small companies, but what it does and how it augments humanity to some extent, I think that is going to be a disruptive change. Thank you, Axel. Um, we have another question for Daniel. Do you see AI adding value to ESG? Hmm. Um, right now, I'm not 100% sure because this is, of course, a highly regulated environment and where the regulation is also constantly um, changing. But in general, of course, over time, if the rules are clear, the AI can learn these rules. And I would believe that then this is um, a very good actually area of application for AI to just evaluate through all these issues and also be a bit less biased. Perhaps I mean, we know of issues, for example, in ESG research, if you look at scoring, sustainability scores or something like this from different companies, they deviate a lot of this. And this is one of the big criticisms of the whole movement to sustainability and ESG, of course, that there's no clear guidelines that different people score it differently and so on. And so having a bit of a more objectivity and being able to look at a lot of different data, we're talking about the scope one, scope two, scope three emissions, and all these kind of different things, and to be able to look at everything and evaluate all um, the data, I think to come up with a somewhat decent score would be uh, quite a big um, game changer in this area also. Okay, thank you, Daniel. Now, um, we have finished our time, unfortunately. Um, all the questions that are left, we can answer them later one-to-one. -one. Uh, I remember all of our viewers that this conversation um, is going to be sent uh, through by your email um, if you register to the event, so do not worry. Also, all of the recap presentation that was shared today is going to be shared with you guys, remember. Uh, so in conclusion, well, first of all, Thank you to all the speakers today for giving such valuable insight. Today's conversation really gave us, you know, that perspective and the really deep dive into AI adoption. And it's clear that AI is here to stay. It offers tremendous opportunities for institutional investors. And while by embracing AI, organizations can really drive innovation and gain a competitive edge. We hope the materials that we share with you today, well, will all help you viewers with your AI adoption journey. Um, well, remember everyone um, that um, we are going to have a, an upcoming live event, so stay tuned and thank you very much for watching us today and thank you all to Maria, Axel, Giuseppe and Daniel. See you next time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye.